Hello and warm greetings. Welcome to The Analyst by Vajir Ahmed Ravi. Today is 4th of April and we would be discussing some of the very important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. The first article is the borrowing by the states as there have been a recent controversy between the center and the states over this issue. The second article is the booming India's private space sector and the way forward. The third article is related to the recently released report by The Lancet which talks about the demographic transition which India is going to witness. The fourth article is about the ring of fire as Taiwan has been recently struck with a disastrous earthquake. Then we will talk about geophysical phenomena of the GLOFs that is Glacial Lake Outburst Flood. Finally, we will have prelims snippets where we would be discussing some of the very important articles from the prelims perspective. So the first article is related to the borrowing by the states. See, we have recently witnessed that the financial relations between the union and the various state governments has not been good. It has been a matter of vigorous debates. That is the reason the government of Kerala has approached the Supreme Court with a question that how much can the state governments borrow from the market to bridge the access of its expenditures over the receipts. Now this forms a part of GS3 government budgeting. So let's start. Now, if we go into the constitutional aspects of borrowing, so the constitution of India empowers the states to borrow money for developmental works, right, within a framework so that there are limits so that they actually maintain fiscal prudence, right. So, article 292 in particular, this article grants executive power to the union government to borrow upon the security of consolidated fund of India, right, and the limitations set by the Indian Parliament, right? That is the case. Now, if we go into the article 293 sub clause 1, now this article empowers each state's executive to borrow within the territory of India secured by the state's consolidated fund. And this borrowing is subject to the limits set by the respective state legislature, right? So, this limit is actually it's subject to the limit set by the respective state legislature right now if we talk about the restrictions on the state borrowing so article 293 sub clause 3 it says that a state cannot borrow money if there is an outstanding loan from the central government or a loan guaranteed by the central government unless the central government consen consents so this places a crucial restriction on state borrowing right this article now what is the consent of the central government right we saw a state can borrow money if the central government gives the consent now the consent of the central government as per article 293 the central government consents consent for borrowing by a state with outstanding loan can be granted with conditions for example how the additional funds are to be used right so that is one of the condition the other condition can be the purpose of loan, right? The repayment terms. So these are the conditions which the central government can impose if they need additional borrowing from the market, right? Now, what are the sources for the state governments, right? Sources of funds. The first is own revenues. That is from tax and non-tax, right? Then we have got transfers from the union government, right? That is as share of taxes and grants, right? The third is that market borrowings, which we are actually discussing upon, right? So, the central government has actually set a limit upon the borrowing, that is 3% of the state's gross state domestic product, right? It cannot exceed, the market borrowing, borrowings cannot exceed this limit of 3%, right? Now, the issue is that several states, also Kerala, they contend that the, their borrowing power is being curtailed, right? And their capacity to fulfill their financial commitments is being actually curtailed, right? Second aspect is that there are also issues with respect to the violation of the principles of federalism. Now, these are the issues, these are the two issues which the states have brought these issues in front of the Supreme Court, right? Now, if we compare the spending of the union and the states, that is the social service spending, that is which includes the health and education right so we'll see that in 2023 the union government actually spent rupees 2230 billion 
right at the same time the states actually spent 19182 billion right now this amount is 8.6 times in social service right if you go in the sector specific terms for education the states cumulatively they spent 2.6 times more than the center if you we talk about the health the states actually spent 3.8 times the cumulatively all the states spent 3.8 times more than that of center now that is this number is huge this tells us about the importance of social spending by the state right now it it doesn't mean that the central government doesn't spend in the social sector see there are priorities right so priorities also matter according to the constitutionally mandated functions and roles for example the defense of india right so the union spending on defense was almost twice its social spending talking about the union spending on transport urban development that was almost 2.4 times the social spending right so what we see that definitely the states are spending more on the social sector but it doesn't mean that the center is not spending on the social sector at the same time it means that the states are all the states are the one who are spending more on the social sector right now if we talk about the borrowing by the states in particular the rbi actually categorize the budgetary expenditures by the union and the states as developmental and non developmental now what do we mean by developmental and non developmental see developmental expenditures mean it includes expenditure on social service plus economic service right for example agriculture industry if we talk about the non developmental expenditure now it includes for example the pensions the subsidies right and so on so this is developmental and non developmental expenditure now if you go into the data you will see that the developmental expenditure incurred by the state governments have been have risen significantly over the last two decades look at the graph right so the state's government developmental expenditure in the red right it is far greater than if you see the union gov government developmental in the blue right so it has consistently increased more so especially in the period from 2004 5 to 2021 22 right so the percentage increase was almost from 8.8% to 12.5% right the increase that is in terms of the percentage of gdp right the total spending as a percentage of gdp it was around 8.8% in 2004-5 and it increased to 12.5% in 2021-22 by the states right on the other hand the social and developmental expenditures by the union they have remained somewhat unchanged over this two decade period see this in this graph you see this line is almost straight right there are not very much ups in this graph right as far as the spending by the union government is concerned now if you just look at this graph you will see that there has been a reduction in the social se sector spending by the union government right so what you will see is that this spending increase which was from 2008 till 2012 this actually decreases from 2012 onwards right and you see the revival in the covid period covid times because the government actually gave financial impetus to different sectors of the economy right including the social sectors right so what we see is ultimately it is the spending it is the spending by the state government that has helped to alleviate the livelihood crisis because of low growth in jobs and rural incomes right so ultimately the the major responsibility for the social sector spending has been with the states right now if we talk about kerala's case in particular we will see that the social spending it has ranged for almost 40 to 50 percent for four decades that is from 1960s till 1990s right now and this actually saw a sort of downfall in the mid 2000s look at this graph right 
so what we witness there is that the social spending of kerala has been on a low trajectory right at the same time the other states are actually increasing their social spending right however if you include the spending by the local self governments the social spending of the local self government in kerala right see we see that the budgetary expenditure for the local self government in kerala that has been around 6% right so if you include their spending as well you'll see that the average spending by kerala in the social sector has been more than the other states right so look at this graph you'll see that kerala social spending has been continuously above the average of the other states right now let's talk about the data points in particular see so sizable chunk of the government expenditure in kerala on the social services in the revenue account that is around 31.7% that is paid in the form form of salaries paid to the government employees right nurses teachers most of them almost half of them are women right and they have actually led to the good developmental parameters indicators of kerala at the same time at the same time the pensions paid in the kerala that has been around 16.4% that now this is a huge number right that is the pension paid to the senior citizens and disadvantaged sections right so this is a big number we need to reduce it right now the concern is that only 10.6% of the kerala's budgetary resources was directed to the capital expenditure side now this number is small and we know that spending in the capital expenditure is important for the development of infrastructure right the de development of different institutions right so this is a point of concern so you just see that in the graph it is only 10.6% right now if we talk about the specific case here in kerala we see that the union government's transfers to kerala they actually declined to 2.8% in 2023 and 24 right and state's own revenues they remained at around 8% right so for actually meeting its budget expenditure of around 14.2% of the gross state domestic product it only needed a borrowing of 3.4% however the limit set is 3% so that becomes a cause of concern for kerala right so now since center has already imposed a restriction right and the case in case is in supreme court we need to see what the directives of the supreme court would be right now if we talk about whether the government spending has to be increased or not there are actually arguments which support that government spending should be increased why see for states to translate their advantage in the social sphere many of the states which have good social spending they have actually have had good social indicators now these social indicators need to be transformed into greater income right then then only we can actually reap the benefits in economic terms right then the focus of this spending should be on higher education and research why so that it can facilitate the drive for knowledge economy right so the focus has to be on higher education and skill development next since there is scarcity with respect to own resources there needs to be sustainable market borrowings right what we mean is that see most of the states they depend upon the domestic financial institutions for borrowing right for example you have got public sector banks insurance companies now these are the entities which actually mobilize savings from the wider uh, public right many of the states in india have ha have actually huge private savings now these private savings can be used for borrowing for sustainable market borrowing by the state right next is that many of the economics of the keynesian tradition they support government borrowing for actually starting a virtuous cycle that is if borrowing is used for creating jobs and enhancing the incomes these economists say that the borrowing is good right if you are borrowing for the sake of creating jobs for the sake of increasing the incomes then that is a good proposition right next there are 
different developmental dilemmas, especially which the southern Indian states they are facing. For example, aging population. Right. Next is the large outgo for pensions. Then you have got out migration of youth. Now these are the development dilemmas which these states have faced. Now in order to deal with it, they need more and effective spending. Right. Next that see the borrowing should be a part of a larger plan right a sustainable plan and it should not be sort of a firefighting exercise which we are actually witnessing in kerala's case right so what is needed is that you need to have sustainable borrowing mechanisms where the needs of the states are considered as we have already seen that the social spending of the states is far higher than that of the center now the case is already with the supreme court let's wait and see what the directives of the supreme court would be in this particular case so the second article is about India's booming private space sector. See, we have seen that ISRO has been following into space missions, for example, to the sun, to the moon with space telescopes, landers, astronauts. Now, this actually calls for a greater participation by the private sector. That is the reason that the government has actually allowed 100% FDI in the space sector, right? And this actually calls, this actually has made the private players to look for funding from the overseas inv investors. Now, this forms a part of GS3 space and also investments, right? Now, if we talk about the history of ISRO's commercialization, we'll see that since 1969, when, is, when ISRO was founded, while the manufacturing of the main, main systems, for example, the launch vehicles, the spacecraft, right, the boosters, now this was primarily handled by the ISRO itself through in-house capacity or with international collaboration. But we see that several PSEs, for example, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited and private companies, for example, Godrej, aerospace right they helped in manufacturing the auxiliary spacecraft components for example we have got satellite systems right ground stations then we have got communication systems right so these are the auxiliary space systems right components which these both private and the public sector contributed right now in 1992 we had the Department of Space, which actually created the Antrix Corporation Limited. Now, it was the objective was to promote, market and deliver the commercial products of ISRO. Now, this actually acts as a conduit between the ISRO and the private industry in the form of facilitating technology transfer, right? Then assess the viability of projects, right? That is projects, that is joint ventures. Also, it develops the industrial capabilities of the Indian space sector, right? These are the functions which Antrix performs. See, while Antrix has been launching commercial, foreign commercial satellites since 1999, a major boost was actually achieved in June 2016 when PSLV C-37, it injected 104 satellites in one go. Now, that is a huge feat, right? Now, then in 2019, the government of India established the new Space India Limited, right? Now, it is also a commercial arm of ISRO. It offers launch services, building satellites, subsystems, remote sensing services in collaboration with the Indian space companies, that is domestic companies. Now, it must be noted that while the Antrix, the commercial arm handles, it deals with the satellites and the launch vehicles with the foreign customers, new Space India Limited deals with the capacity building of the local industry, that is domestic space industry, right? Now, if we talk about the role of private players, we'll see that older space companies, they actually catered mainly to manufacturing space components for ISRO, right? For example, we have got Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. Now, it still provides structural parts of several space components. For example, heat, shield, assembly, right? Nose cone, assembly, then cryogenic engine for launch vehicles, right? Then you have got companies like the private companies like Godrej Aer Aerospace. Now this manufactures liquid pro propulsion engines, right? Complex fabricated systems. Also, satellite thrusters, right? Then it also manufactures actuators, walls, right? For the spacecraft, right? Then we have got other company such as Ananth Technologies and Data Patterns. Now these are the core manufacturers for of ISRO's ground station, right? So they are focused upon 
manufacturing the nano satellites the printed circuit boards for various controllers then you have got the control units then the sensors also they focus upon the telemetry right that is communications system right also sensors right that is the importance of these private companies however these companies only manufactured the components of the space spacecraft if we look at the independent and dedicated companies space companies private space companies right that only came into prominence after the center rolled out dedicated schemes and fundings for the startups right it was in 2012 that the first space startup dhruv space private limited was actually established in hyderabad right then with time you have got many startups space startups for example bellatrix aerospace then you have got agnikul then you got manastu space then sky root right so constantly you have we are witnessing the promotion and the evolution of the startup culture in the space sector right then over 200 space startups have already been registered right and they have attracted investments worth more than 1000 crores in 2023 itself right now the focus of these startups has been to design and manufacture satellites to launch vehicles right ground stations propulsion systems propellants and satellite subsystems and offer launch services using isro's polar satellite launch vehicle or geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle right or the private launch vehicle right so their contribution has been increasing and now they're acting as independent agencies not just providing the components but offering specific services for example the launch services right now if we talk about the regulatory structure right the indian regulatory structure we have got it is being facilitated with for example the first is in space that is indian national space promotion and authorization center right now this was actually set up in 2020 right now this is a single window independent nodal agency and it was set up to authorize promote and supervise the activities of private non government entities in the space sector right then it looks into the non government entities activities such as building launch vehicles satellites sharing infrastructure with department of space or isro's facilities right then it also monitors and evaluates the proposals from the non government and enterprises that is and then it issues the authorizations for space launch and test firing then it also provides the technical incubation by what it means is that the st space startups which have recently come into the market it is actually providing the facilities to do, to those space startups right and it also promotes space tourism right and boosting students participation right since its inception it has already formulated around 45 memorandum of understandings with different non governmental entities in the space sector right so what we see is in space has been promoting and encouraging the private space sector so what we see is that in space has been constantly putting its efforts to enhance to increase the role of private se space sector right next is that in february 2021 there were the guidelines for the private sector to acquire the geospatial data see let's first talk about the geospatial data see geospatial data is any information about a particular event or an object right or a phenomena on a particular location on the earth and how we come to know about it with the help of the coordinates of latitude and longitude right that is what geospatial information is all about right so in february 2021 there were guidelines for the private companies to actually acquire all the geospatial data and the maps from the government agencies without the licenses right and the permission for collection use and dissemination was also not needed except for certain categories right this was actually enhanced it was improved through the national geospatial policy which was released in 2022 now it actually provided a framework for the development of geospatial 
ecosystem and it allowed for democratization of data and increased the private sector participation right it integrated the private sector into this geospatial data framework right then this policy also promotes it also promotes the private sector participation in the form of formation of geospatial data that is collection formation of geospatial data right that is the case now in 2023 we had the indian space policy right now this indian space policy this also permits it expands the domain of non governmental entities by offering communication services internet services remote sensing services and navigation services other services to the private sector so the private sector can now actually offer these services to the common people right moreover this policy has paved the way for the isro to actually transition from just manufacturing systems to enhanced role in research and development so what is what it is facilitating is that the isro should not just focus upon these manufacturing components this can be done by the private sector the isro should actually focus upon the core research and developmental aspects right then the recent change in the fdi policy which actually allowed 100% fdi in the space sector now this actually has paved the way for private sector to seek more funding from overseas investors right the increase in the fdi limit right now let's talk about what are the benefits of a thriving private sector right the first is innovation and agility see this innovation and agility it actually brings fresh perspective and are often quicker to adopt new technologies right these private sector enterprises moreover it fosters a more dynamic and competitive space industry right then you have got cost effectiveness see competition drives cost effectiveness solutions for space exploration and applications moreover it leads to efficient use of resources right when the private sector is involved it leads to generally more efficient use of resources then you have got job creation see this growth creates job creation that is in the areas of engineering data analysis right or research so it offers different job opportunities next you have got global collaboration so with international players it actually leads to enhanced knowledge transfer right through exchange through knowledge exchange right these are the benefits of integrating the private sector into the space domain right now let's talk about the challenges what are the challenges see the first is the access to the capital securing funding still remains a hurdle for many space startups moreover what we need is innovative financing models such as venture capitals right that is what needed second is technological expertise see developing sophisticated sp space technologies require significant expertise and resources which still the private sector doesn't have so what the need is that there needs to be an robust a robust collaboration between the private sector and let's say isro international organizations space organizations right there needs to be more collaborations right next is that the regulatory environment see while the regulations have been relaxed as we just saw through different mechanisms right but a clear stable and predictable regulatory framework is still necessary for these private sector enterprises to thrive in the market right so what the need is greater investor confidence is needed so if the investors are confident about a particular private enterprise they would definitely invest in that right so what is needed is that there needs to be a sort of a proper way forward for this private sector right so we'll see so the first is continued policy reforms the government should continuously refine policies to encourage the private participation for example simplify the licensing procedure right it should not be restricted that only few private participants are allowed to enter into the market right next is funding and the investment in infra infrastructure the there needs to be an encouragement in the investment in the sector through for example 
tax breaks public private partnerships right these are the instruments which can be used to encourage the investments next skilling and training program see we need to develop specialized academic programs right obviously this is very technological intensive so what you need to make is specialized programs and taking initiatives in space technologies what we can do is focus on introducing new courses in india's higher education institutions with respect to the space right next technology transfer and collaboration facilitating the knowledge sharing and the technology transfer between the isro and the private participants is very much necessary as it would accelerate the technological advancement within the private sector right so if you have constant collaboration that would definitely accelerate the technological advancement in the private sector itself right next is focus on niche areas specific areas so indian private companies can identify and specialize in particular areas for example in small satellite launch vehicles right or sp specific space applications or developing specific materials for space right then you have got promoting next is building a strong supply chain ecosystem what is needed is that we need to encourage robust domestic supply chain for space related components and materials because we need to reduce the dependence on the foreign sec players partners we need to develop strong domestic supply chains right next is promoting international partnerships through engagement with international space agencies and private companies now this would foster more technological advancement if we have got as we discussed collaboration with the international players now what is needed is that see we definitely know that there are hurdles but we see that the bright light is that the silver lining is that that the private sector has been slowly expanding its reach in the indian space sector so what is needed is that we need to provide those policies which actually enhance their role the private sector and so that it can also allow isro to focus upon core research and development right for example the missions to the moon to the sun right and other space missions right so it can focus upon that so that the task which is it is performing for example the manufacturing space components that can be actually transferred to the private players right and moreover it can lead to a comprehensive technological development right with proper partnership that is the need of the hour now the next article is related to demographic transition see we recently had a report by the lancet which actually projected that the total fertility rate in india is projected to go down to 1.29 by 2051 now all this imply that the population may stabilize much before than 2065 as projected by united nations we look into it now it actually forms a part of gs2 development and also some parts of gs3 right now Let's talk about the United Nations report. So according to United Nations Population Division report, it said that the India's population would reach to 1.65 billion by 2065 before it starts declining. So before it starts declining, the population would reach to 1.65 billion by 2065. Now the Lancet report has actually said that the total fertility rate. Now first see what total fertility rate. See total fertility rate is the average number of children that a woman gives birth to over her lifetime right that is total fertility rate now it would actually go down to 1.29 by 2050 now what are actually the projections right how we can correlate the tfr which is given by the lancet with what the un said right see the tfr which is used by the un for this calculation of 1.65 billion or by the government which the indian government uses in national family health survey that is 5 national family health survey 5 now that is much higher than what is actually being projected by the lancet right so it says it actually implies that we would reach to population stabilization stabilization much before 2065 right now let's talk about what are the factors which actually are responsible for this demographic transition first is rapid pace of economic development which we have witnessed in the last 3 decades right that is one of the reasons second is lower infant and child mortality rates now this is, has actually reduced the need for large family 
if there is reduced infant and child mortality obviously the need for a large family reduces right then rise in women's education has led to more work participation rate because they have acquired more skills right that makes them to join labor force in greater numbers right next we have got improvement in the housing conditions see what this has done is that it has actually led to the improvement in the security systems that is social security systems right now what is the impact of rapid decline in the total fertility rate see it is actually leading to fall in the dependency rate and a larger share of the working adults in the population this would actually result into surplus in income which can be translated into economic growth and it would lead to positive inter generational transfers that is transfers from the one generation to the other generation right next we have got it also has led to a case where this dependency ratio we know that it's reducing we have got a larger working population but subsequently with time this larger sh the share of the working population would actually reduce and it would result into the elderly dependent population increasing right it is projected that the dependency ratio would actually increase from 13.8 in 2011 to 23 in 2036 now we will have the same situation the similar situation which countries of the west or china or japan are facing that is greater dependent population right next we have got an information which actually says that this decline will be not even across the states right it would be uneven for example it is estimated that the larger states for example up bihar or jharkhand they would take approximately a decade more to reach than the other states to reach to the replacement level fertility right so that is also the case now let's talk about the positive impact of this demographic transition see the first is with actually with decline in population growth what we would what we would see is that the amount of capital resources and the infrastructure available per capita that would increase right then what we see with the reduction in in fertility with the reduction in fertility there would be relocation of resources for the education and skill development of the children right next what would happen is that it would affect the age distribution of the population leading to increasing the fraction of the labor force right though for a limited period but it would definitely increase the proportion of the working population right then the declining tfr would lead to a situation where the number of children enrolling in the schools would be lower now see what would happen is this would most probably increase the educational outcomes right because the additional resources which are now being used they would be spent on specifically for that limited pool of candidates for the limited pool of children right so it would result into increase in the educational standards right then with less time needed for the child care right the, there can be an increase in the women labor force participation rate we are already witnessing this in south india where the enrollment for manrega has been increasing right slowly with time so it actually tells that there would be increased labor force participation rate of the women then with focus skill creation there would be a shift of workforce from agriculture to the industries and services however this needs proper skill development only then we would be able to actualize it right now it would also lead to what we are witnessing there would be an enhanced movement from the north to the south that is from the labor surplus states of the north to the labor deficit states of south right for example states like maharashtra and gujarat they would actually be attracting greater labor from the northern states right now that would actually bring spatial balance 
in the labor market the spatial balance that is with respect to the space right it would bring a spatial balance with respect to the labor market now what is the way forward for actually successful demographic transition right the first is investing in human capital that is education and skill development that we need to focus on quality education for all align with the interest of the job market we need to focus upon vocational training we need to focus upon stem that is science technology engineering and mathematics right next is that healthcare and nutrition have to be given priority right access to quality healthcare for all particularly women and children should be the priority right we need to address the malnutrition especially among the children right and and the women right especially among the children and the women and we need to create healthy environment that is we need to focus upon wash water sanitation and hygiene right next is that we need to create employment opportunities how see we need to focus upon entrepreneurship pro promotion through incubation centers through seed funding right through easier access to credit now this would actually lead to new jobs and unleash innovation right if you have entrepreneurship definitely it would lead to more innovation right definitely it would lead to more job creation then you have got labor market reforms what is needed is that we need to promote job creation through the labor market reforms that we need to bring flexibility in the labor market for example we need to ensure workers right that is what is needed next is demographic shifts and in social infrastructure we need to focus upon ur urbanization planning that is investing in affordable housing efficient transportation systems moreover we need to focus upon as i said sanitation facilities proper drainage systems right that has to be the focus then elderly facilities understand that the share of the dependent population would increase that is we need to provide geriatric care geriatric care that is what is needed that is a care for the senior citizens sir that is what is needed so we need to invest in elderly facilities to support the growth the population growth or in the elderly population so what we are seeing is that harnessing this demographic Uh, dividend if we say so harnessing this demographic div dividend it actually requires a multi pronged approach right as we discuss for example investing in human capital for example creating employment opportunities for example demographic shifts for example empowering women right for example ensuring effective governance so it requires a multi pronged approach and only then india can leverage the dividend as we call it it has the demographic dividend it has it can only leverage that if we actually focus upon these measures right then we can have sort of a brighter future for all see the next article is about the ring of fire we have recently witnessed the disastrous earthquake which has struck taiwan right almost 9 people have died and 800 have got more than 800 have got injured right so this has been termed as the biggest earthquake in the last 25 years right and it has been the magnitude has been around 7.2 magnitude while the us geological survey says that the magnitude is around 7.4 right so this forms a part of gs1 geophysical phenomena right so let's talk about it let's first discuss what an earthquake is see an earthquake is the shaking of the earth surface why because of sudden release of energy in earth's crust when you have sudden release of energy in the earth's crust you have got the earthquake now what are the causes see we have got tectonic plates now what are tectonic plates tectonic plates are the lithospheric plates which actually make the earth's crust these are tectonic plates now what happens is once you have got the movement of tectonic plates with respect to each other they rub against each other and the pressure builds up slowly and this actually sometimes lead to sudden jerk right or slip that leads to the release of energy in the form of seismic waves that is a waves which travel throughout the planet those waves are termed as seismic waves right now earthquake can actually range in intensity it can be sort of like weak tremors and also it can be disastrous as we have witnessed in taiwan right now these seismic waves are of three types first is primary waves right we call now these are the compressional waves that travel fastest right and can travel through solid liquid and gas then we have got the secondary waves now these are the waves which travel slower than p waves and they can only travel in solid medium 
not liquid or gaseous right then we have got the surface waves see surface waves are the waves which travel with the words itself says on the surface now these are the waves which are most disastrous right the most destructive are the surface waves now let's talk about epicenter hypocenter see epicenter is actually the place directly above the source of the earthquake right on the earth surface that is the epicenter and hypocenter is the place where the earthquake actually originates also known as the focus right that is the case how the earthquake is measured we have got two scales we have got two scales which are used to measure the earthquake the first is the richter scale now this actually measures the magnitude of the earthquake it's a logarithmic scale and it represents the energy released right it actually represents the energy released in the earthquake right then we have got the mercury intensity scale now this measures the intensity of the ground shaking at the specific location now this is based on the effect the effect of the earthquake on people on buildings that is what the intensity scale is all about right now let's talk about the ring of fire see taiwan is prone to earthquake as it lies along the pacific ring of fire right now this is the place you can just see this is the pacific ocean and all around it you have this ring of fire where the 90% of world's earthquake they actually take place more than 90% of the earthquake take place in this very area itself right now what is ring of fire it is a string of hundreds of volcanoes and the earthquake sites which runs along the pacific ocean semi circling or a horseshoe if you just look at this figure you will see that it resembles like a horseshoe and the overall the it covers a distance of more than 40000 kilometers right next it actually traces it traces the meeting points of numerous tectonic plates we already saw what is tectonic plates for example we have got different tectonic plates we have got the eurasian right we have got the north american we have got the joan de fuca plate we have got the indian australian philippine we have got different different plates so it actually is a meeting point of these different plates which actually encircle the large pacific plate okay now why is this ring of fire is vulnerable to earthquake see now these plates are in a constant relative motion as we just discussed right they are sliding past they are colliding into or they are moving above or below the each other this results into the release of energy right sudden release of energy and that leads to earthquake right simple now why there are so many volcanoes in the ring of fire see what happens is that many of the volcanoes have been formed through a process of subduction of tectonic plates subduction of tectonic plates means that the heavier plate the heavier plate in this case the oceanic plate now this actually shoves under it goes under the lighter plate right when it goes under that is the down going of the oceanic plates when it subducts it heats up and the volatile element mix right the they the the elements over there they mix up and it leads to the formation of magma right this magma rises up the surface and it then leads to the vol formation of volcanoes right that is how you have got volcanoes all around the pacific ring of fire okay next we'll talk about uh, a phenomena a geophysical phenomena which is glof that is glacial lake outburst floods so recently the uttarakhand government has constituted two teams of expert to evaluate the risk posed by five potentially hazardous hazardous glacial lakes in the region now these lakes are prone to GL, glof we'll look into it what it actually is and the kind of events that have been there continuously in the himalayan region right there have been frequent incidents of the glof events right so this forms a part of gs1 geography and gs3 environment and climate change so let's talk about what glof is what is glacial lake outburst flood see there are the disaster events which are caused by the abrupt discharge of water sudden discharge of water from the glacial lakes now we need to understand what is first a glacial lake see these are the depressions which are actually formed once the glacier recedes right once it melts you have got the depression which actually forms a glacial lake right now such lakes are mostly dammed they are mostly controlled by unstable ice or sediments right we call them terminal mo moraines right here we have got a terminal moraine which actually at the terminal it actually holds the glacial lake right now when the boundary around them actually breaks huge amount of water is it actually rushes down now this is referred to glof glof event right and it results in flooding the downstream areas right 
Now, this can be triggered by glacial calving. Now, what it me means is that if a glacial falls into this lake, this it would result into outflow of water, right? That can be a case. Or if the you know if the lake has accumulated a lot of water, and if the the moraine is unable to hold it, then the moraine can actually be breached. It can actually uh, break, would then result into glove event, right? Now, gloves they actually unleash large amount of water, sediment or debris downstream. Now, this actually results into flood waters submerging the valley areas. Next, it also destroys the infrastructure, right? And it leads to huge loss of life and property. Now, this event is obviously natural, but this has been accentuated, increased because of human induced climate change. See, there have been global warming and because of that global warming, these glaciers are actually receding, right? They're melting. And because of that, huge quantity of water is being accumulated. And that is leading to these sometimes these such events of glove events are seen in the news, right? Because the water breaches the capacity of the lake and then you have got such events. Now, why are these gloves under the spotlight as we just discussed so there have been rise in the glove even especially in the himalayan region now this is the region which is prone to most prone to the effects the ill effects of climate change global warming right now soaring global temperatures and rapid infrastructure development especially in these areas the hilly areas it is disturbing the landscape and that is actually leading to these events right then a study a recent study a recent study in the journal nature it pointed that the prime area where these the intensity of the glove events would be higher in the future that is southeastern tibet and the china nepal border area the same journal also talked about in an analysis in, in an analysis in february 2023 it said that almost 3 million people in india and almost 2 million people in pakistan they are under the risk of these glow events this number is very huge right now what is the situation in uttarakhand see uttarakhand has witnessed two glow events if we just go into the past the first has been in 2013 the kedarnath crisis right that was the first case second it was in 2021 in chamoli what happened was that you had flash floods and that led to glove event right now uttarakhand has 13 glacial lakes you can just see in this map you have got different glacial lakes right and these glacial lakes are prone to glove and they have been categorized in different categories for example category a you have got category b you have got category c based on the risks involved right all these glacial lakes are actually categorized in a b c on the basis of risk involved right for proper data analysis now what we see is that mitigating the glove risk it actually requires a multi-pronged approach right first is robust monitoring and early warning system what we mean is that we need to have proper data sets now these data sets should be analyzed and communicated for further policy actions that is the first case then we need to focus on focus upon structural measures what we mean to say is that there has to be controlled release of water from these glacial lakes control release of water right that is what is needed and this requires engineering solutions right next is that we need to have community awareness and preparedness the people of the hilly region right they and other in general they need to be made aware about these glove through for example evacuation drills right or briefing about emergency measures so by actually addressing all these challenges we can mitigate the effects of glof and safeguard the life and property in this prone regions right so that should be the way forward so coming to the prelims snippets we have got the first article of nato that is north atlantic treaty organization so it has been in news so it is an intergovernmental military alliance of 32 member states 30 European and 2 North American, that is US and Canada, right? So it was established in the aftermath of the Second World War. The organization was made through the North Atlantic Treaty, right? And it was signed in Washington, D.C. on uh, this 4th of April, 1949. Now, NATO is a collective security mechanism. What we mean is that these people say that an attack on one 
of the partners is an attack on all and all have to defend each other right so that is what the mechanism of collective defense is all about now this its independent mes uh, members they agree to defend each other against the attacks by the third parties now nato's main headquarter is located uh, it's located in brussels however uh, the military headquarters are actually situ situated in mons in uh, belgium itself right then the combined military spending in 2022 of these uh, members of nato it was around 55% of the global no nominal total right moreover the members have agreed to reach to maintain the target of defense spending of at least 2% of their gdp by 2024 so that is about the nato next we have got pratyush radio telescope so see pratyush actually stands for probing reionization of the universe using signal from hydrogen now this is a radio telescope which is being developed by the raman research institute and with active collaboration from the isro right the objective is to study the universe from the far side you just look at the image right you have this earth and on the far side you have this pratyush right initially isro will place the pratyush into an orbit around the earth after some fine tuning the space agency will launch it towards the moon right pratyush is in the lunar orbit will have the ideal observing condition for operating in free space and to get the details of the far space right far space that is what is the objective of this mission now next is telecom regulatory authority of india now the telecom regulatory authority of india is a regulatory body which is set up by the government of india under the section 3 of the telecom regulatory authority of india act 1997 now this is the regulator of the telecommunication sector in india right and tri is uh, the telecom regulatory authority of india's mission is to create and nurture the condition for the growth of telecommunications in india and to enable the country to have a leading role in the emerging global information society right the trai act was amended by an ordinance effective from 24th january 2000 and it established telecom dispute settlement and appellate tribunal to take over the adjudicatory and disputes functions of the trai right next is united nations human rights council so the united united nations human rights council this is a united nations body whose mission is to actually promote and protect the human rights the council has 47 members and it has a sort of a regional representation right and elected for a staggered 3 year term the headquarters of this council are at united nations office geneva in switzerland the council investigates the allegations of breaches of human rights for example you have got the rights associated to freedom of association assembly freedom of expression the freedom of belief and religion women's right lgbtq community right so the council was established by the united nations general assembly on 15th march 2006 and it actually replaced the united nations commission on human rights so we had uh, some issues with it so it was replaced by this united nations human rights council the council works closely with the office of the high commissioner for the human rights so that's all for today thank you